there's that awkward moment where we both sit down and there's no bit planned. And I, ha I have a bit. You have a bit? Have oh, a thank bit. God. I was worried we would just stumble around awkwardly to look for a bit. Nope, I've got a bit. So we're going to start the edit right here. No one will see the discussion that we've just been having. Yeah, yeah, <clears throat> good, good. Rich, you and I are here today to talk about an Italian movie, and it was your idea. <laughs> that's, that's your bit? That's what that. It's not a bad bit, <laughs> because we all know I hate <laughs> shitty Italian movies. <laughs> but the good, the bad, and the ugly is not a shitty Italian movie. It is definitely an Italian movie, though. You can tell by all the dubbing. What did you say your name was? That's what these southerners are getting out. And when he's found, I'd be scared to be put in his shoes. I thought you were gonna make some kind of joke about me being the ugly. No, no, <laughs> I'm not Mike. <laughs> if Mike were here, the obvious intro would be the good, the bad, we, and the ugly. We are clearly the good, the bad, and the ugly. The good, <laughs> Mike is the bad, yeah. and I am the ugly. Fortunately, you're not in brown face like the actor in this film, so. <laughs> is he in brown face? Uh, that is a, a Jewish Brooklyn actor playing uh, tu Tuco, right? Yeah, Tuco. I actually just learned this. I didn't know until second. after I watched the movie. And now I am horribly uncomfortable. The, guy, the guy's got a ton of credits. Well, that's the thing is like, obviously this is the 60s. It's a different time. Yeah. Great performance. Yeah. So it is what it is. What can you do now? It was in the 60s. But uh, yeah, we're going to talk about the good, the bad, and the ugly. A movie that you love. You like all these uh, I, Sergio Leone movies, I, I right? I have a fond spot in my heart for the, the Dollars trilogy. Which isn't really a trilogy. Which isn't really a trilogy. The, the Man With No Name trilogy, which was a, a, a marketing stunt to try and advertise the three films when they were released in the U.S. in the same year. This man with no name is played by Clint Eastwood. He's going to trigger a whole new style and adventure. Because I didn't realize to watch it this one, he does have a name. He has a name in all three, and it's a different name because he's not really the same character. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're, these are a trilogy. The man with no name. Danger fits him like a tight black glove. He is perhaps the most dangerous man who ever lived. But uh, I, I've uh, never seen any of them. This is one of those movies not that I've actually avoided it, but it was always like, oh, I'll get around to it eventually. I know it's a classic through pop culture osmosis. I feel like I know the whole movie. Obviously, Clint Eastwood with the, the cigar and the poncho and the, the, the music, that score is so iconic. So it's one of those things where I felt like I'd seen the whole movie. So I was like, eh, I'll get around to it eventually. I'm sure it's good. And I never got around to it until just now. And it's one of the best fucking things I've ever seen in my life. Okay. <laughs> okay, I, I, I was kind of curious what you would think of this. I loved this. <laughs> I thought it was so, so good. One of the best directed <laughs> movies I've ever seen. I, I feel like I shouldn't watch the other ones because none of them are going to compare to this. See, see this, is why, this is why I'm glad I'm doing it with you. Mm -hmm. Because I, 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 confession time, I am terrified when I have to do a review. <laughs> like, I'm, I'm best of the worst. I can be a clown and just say stupid shit. But, like, review is the time when you actually need to intellectually break shit down. And yeah, not always. I'm proud to be a prostitute. My 15-year-old son wears a dress. My pimp won't let me go. I'm pregnant by a transsexual. You'll never marry my brother. You dumped me at the altar. Guess what? I'm bisexual. Hands off my lover. Well, like I said, I knew about it through pop culture, so I thought I'd known the whole movie. Because so many, like, it, it's been parodied so much. Uh, now after watching it, I realized that Quentin Tarantino has basically plagiarized every frame of this film throughout the course of his career. I was going to say, um, this is like the first uh, Tarantino movie. Yeah. Yeah, the, uh, the, the opening credit sequence, we'll talk about that. But then that opening bit with uh, Lee Van Cleef going into the house. It's exactly the opening of Inglorious Bastards. Um, and that just the music, too, the Ennio, Ennio Morricone score. It has, like, it has that, you know, super recognizable twang sound, but there are other riffs in it that sound almost like 60s surf rock, <laughs> like like The Ventures or something like that, which Tarantino loves that stuff, too. Well, even structurally, it's like the structure of this movie isn't like one narrative as much as it is a series of cool ideas for scenes. It's Yeah, there is an overall story, and the story is fine, 
But it is sort of like, I mean, it's right there in the title, is that's the three characters. There's the good, the bad, and the ugly, which even the title's ironic because the good guy isn't really a good guy. Everybody's morally gray. Right. But that's the movie, is, is taking all these morally questionable characters and putting them into different scenarios throughout the movie and seeing how they interact. When you have to shoot, shoot, don't talk. Clint Eastwood is definitely not the good in the traditional cowboy with a white hat sense. Mm -hmm. I'm not terribly familiar with your classic 50s westerns, so I don't have that exact context. Well, I know, and I'm not super familiar either, but I know, like, John Wayne's the good guy. And this is and the break from that. he has to shoot the that. bad guy. It's, it reminds me of, because it's, yeah, it's Sergio Leone, Italian filmmaker. It reminds me of that little stint when Paul Verhoeven came to the U.S. and made a bunch of American movies. He made Robocop, Starship Troopers, even Showgirls. And it's like, it has that almost satirical edge of, like, we're looking at American culture from an outsider's perspective. Yeah. Doggy chow. Oh, I used to love doggy chow. <laughs> I used to love doggy chow, too. And this has that, too, where it's like, I mean, even right from the opening, you have the little western town, you see the characters walking on one side of the frame, the other characters walking on the other, and I was like, oh, we're starting right off with a, a showdown. It's like, oh, no, they're all bad guys, and they're going in this place together. <laughs> Through all three of the movies, uh, Clint Eastwood, our, our hero, his primary motivation is always money. <laughs> <laughs> Which I guess the Dollars Trilogy is a good name for it. Like, like you haven't seen the first one. I have a, I, 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 the first one actually might be my favorite. Oh. But uh, there's this town that's got like two criminal factions to it. Mm -hmm. And he comes to town and he's not coming to clean up the town. He's coming to get these people to fight each other so he can make money off of them. <laughs> like, he comes into a troubled town and he just makes everything fucking worse for his own profit. And that's the story of For a Fistful of Dollars. Okay, that's great. Yeah. Because that's, yeah, at the beginning of this movie, he's uh, using this guy's, uh, the, his bounty for his own advantage. He's a scam artist, basically. He's teamed up with Tuco because Tuco's worth so much money and bounty and teamed up with him to scam all these different towns. Oh, it's a great <laughs> scam, too. And you, don't, you watch it for the first time, you don't know it's a scam at first. It's like, oh, yeah. oh, our hero has come. He has caught the bad guy, and now he is turning him in for the money. Mm -hmm. And then, shockingly, he rescues the bad guy as they're about to hang him. Yeah. So he can go to the next town and turn him in again for the money. Mm -hmm. Which ties in with the ending. The, you know, the hanging comes back at the end, but... Still not a good guy, but he's had a slight change of heart. He doesn't let him die. <laughs> They've come to a sort of understanding. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's like I said, yeah. like everyone's that moral gray area that every character is in throughout it. Although the uh, Lee Van Cleef character, he's definitely the bad. Yeah. Like, that, I, I know, like, again, directors that have been influenced by Sergio Leone, John Carpenter, cast him in uh, Escape from New York because of this movie. And he just, I'm sure... At some point in his career, he's played a good man, but he looks so fucking evil. Well, you like the second movie then, because he plays a heroic character in the second movie. Really? Yeah. Why yeah. would you ever cast this man as a heroic figure? He's good. He's actually really good. Okay. I mean, he's a good actor, so I don't doubt it, but I just look at his face and I was like, that guy's the devil. He, he is the, the contrast to Clint Eastwood's like gritty outlaw, and he's like, wears a nice suit, mm. and he's got all this fancy gear, and... He's a more professional bounty hunter. Okay. Yeah. Another, another weird thing about these movies is you'll see the same actors playing entirely different parts. Mm. Yeah. Well, that's, yeah, that's, again, that's why it's not really a trilogy. Yeah. But another uh, filmmaker that this probably influenced would be, like, George Miller with the Mad Max movies, because it's the same thing. Guy shows up in a town, gets caught up in their whole thing. Uh, he has actors show up in later movies as different characters. The helicopter, the gyro pilot. Gyro pilot, and the, the toe cutter from the first Mad Max. Oh, He's yeah. uh, a Morton Joe uh, yeah. and Fury Road. And, and this one, unlike the other ones, epic. Well, that's, that's the other thing that, and maybe this is my own naivety about this movie. I didn't know that it took place during the Civil War, and the Civil War played such an important part in the story. Mm -hmm. I had no idea. The Civil War just runs throughout this whole, whole movie. Just go out in the background sometimes. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's, and uh, the fact that our main characters don't really give a shit 
about any of it. <laughs> that amazing scene when the battle's going on and they have the gurney that they're uh, carrying the explosives on. And then the other uh, uh, soldiers walk by and they're like pretending to pick up a dead yeah, body. And then they just drop him to the ground. Uh, uh, <laughs> that, that, again, that's sort of like outsider cynicism to American culture. <laughs> And the fact, like, I, I don't know, I know this all existed in the same, same time period, but it almost makes uh, our main characters, their story feel so quaint. Where it's like, oh, what, uh, cowboys, uh, westerns, they're gonna they have to shoot the bad guy. And there's this epic, you know, civil war going on in the background. Mm -hmm. It makes them look like, like characters from a completely other era. Their conflicts feel so, like, petty in yeah. comparison to what's really happening in the world. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's, and that's a whole angle I didn't know anything about. So <laughs> it's, it's amazing. <laughs> well, let's start at the very beginning. I want to talk about opening credit scenes because they don't really exist anymore. It's like this has an amazing opening credit scene with these, these cool graphics and, of course, the Morricone score. And that used to be what starts the movie to kind of set the tone. Just by, like, interesting title sequences. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. and now, like, with the Marvel movies, they still kind of have those, but they've moved them to the end credits. <laughs> All of the Marvel, it's like they, like, as people are leaving the theater, that's when the cool, interesting visual stuff is happening. <laughs> My, my favorite one is actually, I know, I know you haven't watched the, the, all of them, the, the second one, I love the title intro. It's just a big wide shot. There's just a guy on the horse, like in the far, he's in the far distance, he's like a little speck, guy on a horse. Mm -hmm. You hear a gunshot, he falls off the horse, horse runs away, and then they just start having credits. Over that, like there's just this corpse, <laughs> there's this corpse in the distance, and the credit sequence starts. Well, now I gotta watch this one too, damn it. <laughs> I'm going to watch all these movies. But, but, I purposely avoided, I was going to watch all three, and I was like, if I do that, they're probably all going to blend together in my brain. So I'll just watch this one, and we'll talk about this one. This one feels the most, this one stands out the most, just visually, like, none of the other ones are as epic as this. Okay. With the big war going on in the background. Yeah. Both, the other two are kind of smaller in scale. Okay. But still different movies. Mm. But that's, yeah, I mean, the, the entire, like, visual language that we associate with Westerns, because again, talking about like the old American westerns, they're just shot like they look like TV shows. You know, everything's so flat and everybody's so clean. And in this movie, everybody's just like constantly got like dirt under their fingernails. Haven't you ever seen a western? Yeah, I have, Doc. And Clint East would never want anything like this. We get a character early on. Forget about the man with no name. We get the man with no legs. <laughs> Does he even have a waist? Like. There is very little of his lower body. There, there's not much left of him. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, and that's... Uh, that's I'm another, the horror of the war is just peeking in the background. Yeah, it's, there's it's, another part later when they go and people are getting, like, cleaned up. There's a guy missing an arm. And it's just, yeah, it's so much... Not that this is a super violent movie, that the way that, like, I don't know, where there's just, like, constant squibs going off. Uh, it, but just, like, tonally, it's very grim and violent. Life has little value. Mm-hmm. Which isn't anything, I guess, with Westerns in general, but uh, I feel like that's more so with a movie like this than it is with the more kind of John Ford American. I don't want to put those down because I haven't seen those, but that's the, that's the impression I get of them. Right. Just in, my, in the right. back of my head that I think that's what those are supposed to be. Yeah. And it seems just so much so boring compared to this grime. <laughs> this grime. <laughs> this grimy, filthy, wonderful movie. Well, you're, and you're, yeah, we should point out, you're holding up the 4K release. This is a new, like, recently released 4K. It's all cleaned up, restored. And I can't imagine, I'm assuming you watched these, like, on cable or something growing up. Yeah. Like, watching a cropped 4x3, like, so much of this movie is just in the... Uh, and I would assume this is an influence on John Carpenter, those widescreen, you know, compositions. Again, with this subversion, though, the very first shot you see after the opening credits, you get this, you know, wide shot of the mountain range. Then an actor pops his ugly face <laughs> right into the front of the lens. <laughs> and that's another advantage of the 4K is that made this, like, the, the human face has never looked sweatier than it does in this movie. <laughs> well, he, he loves his close-ups. Yeah. You see a lot of Clint Eastwood's squinty eyes. Well, that's, yeah, that's another kind of convention of Westerns is the, the close-up of the eyes. The, I, uh, I think that comes from this. Yeah, the, that and the, uh, the kind of hip-high camera shot, you know, the can about to touch the gun. Like, it's all there, and it all feels fresh. It doesn't feel like a cliche, even though it all has gone on to be cliches. 
I mean, the, the, the showdown itself is a cliche, but I mean, all of the all of the movies have a different twist on the the final, you know, showdown. Mm-hmm. Bulletproof vest. <laughs> Great flick. Great freaking flick. It's like this. You got like the the, the three on one thing, which is kind of different. Yeah. And basically, the fact that Clint Eastwood's character is a big, giant, filthy cheater. <laughs> He took out Tuco's uh, bullets the night before. Oh, that, that, that final, the final showdown in this is absolutely rigged, and I, I love it. Well, it, especially because there's such a, it's something that's funnier in retrospect. Like when you're watching it, there's that Morricone score again is so epic. And the, the, the pacing of the editing and the shot choices, how it's like as, it, as the tension builds, the, the cuts get quicker. Quicker and closer. Like, quicker and closer. And then it turns out that the whole thing was rigged. Yeah, and there was, one quick blast. Yeah, and there, it's just done. There, there was no tension because Clint Eastwood the, took all of uh, the bullets out of Tuco's gun. Like, he's just going to shoot Lee Van Cleef. Yeah, <laughs> Lee Van Cleef and, and Tuco, they're both like, which, which one do I shoot first? Oh, God, there's two different people. What do I do? And Clint Eastwood just knows. This epic buildup. I, I just got to worry about that one guy. <laughs> you see, in this world, there's two kinds of people, my friend. Those with loaded guns, and those who dig. He even cheated with the rock. There's no name on the damn rock he yeah. puts on the ground. Although technically it's not cheating. Technically it's not cheating, but no. if they won, yeah. if they somehow won, they would be screwed. Well, that's another thing that ending tying in with the uh, the Civil War stuff is like I'm picturing earlier they're talking about, oh, this graveyard and there's gold buried in one of the one of the graves. And I'm picturing like a tiny little makeshift graveyard with like, 20 tombstones or something and then they get there and there's just like hundreds of tombstones of dead soldiers the, w- the way they shoot that too it's like that that goes on forever where he's looking and the camera's just spinning and spins faster and oh my god there's so many graves yeah yeah eventually the camera is just spinning because it's gotten so disoriented from all the dead bodies of oh. all these civil war uh, soldiers that have been killed all of the dead bodies all of the corpses and yet it's a joyous thing yeah these petty people <laughs> just want their money <laughs> And in this horrible graveyard of death, they're going to get rich. <laughs> well, I wanted to talk about Tuco because he's the best character in the movie. Yeah. It's, it's, you know, it's known as the man with no name trilogy, but in this movie, he steals the show. Yeah. Like Clint Eastwood. He's, yeah, he's the Western guy. Everybody knows him from these movies and. But this is Tuco's movie because there's a scene in this where he goes into like a gun shop and he's looking at all the guns. And that's a weird little scene, which I kind of like. Yeah, well, that's like, again, it's a little aside. Like, hey, I like watching this guy. Let's watch him do something. He's going to go into a gun shop. Um, Can, I wonder how, how like real to life is that? Can you just assemble a revolver from parts of different revolvers? I, I don't know enough about guns. Maybe back then you could. I'm assuming it, you can't now. That might be nonsense, but it, it, it's really just interesting. Like, oh, he, he knows guns really well, and he's making the, the, ki- the perfect gun that he wants. Yeah. And I'm sure someone in the comments, that doesn't work. You can't just put a Remington next to a Magnum. <laughs> Whatever else. That's all wrong. <laughs> Cinema sin. Like, that performance is great, and just the, the different kind of dynamics of all the characters, the way they interact with each other. And Tuco is, he's, he's bad. He'll double cross anybody, but he's also really dumb. So he's not good at it. And that's interesting for one of the main characters. <laughs> he's, he's he would an, be a much more effective criminal if he wasn't so dumb, but he's like fun to watch. Yeah. <laughs> it's, he's, he's pitiful. Yeah. Unlike, unlike Angel Eyes, who's just a prick. Mm-hmm. Tuco is kind of sad in a way. Yeah. Like that scene where he, he meets his brother. You became a priest because you were too much of a coward to do what I do. <laughs> and he's horribly disappointed in Tuco. Yeah. Yeah. Well, as he should he, be. He doesn't really say as much. Well, he doesn't have to. He doesn't have to. <laughs> we get it. <laughs> yeah. And that's, again, like going with the kind of situational. We're just going to take a little break and we're going to have a scene where Tuco visits his brother, who's a priest. <laughs> It's not moving the story forward, but it's just a little character scene. There's a lot of there's a lot of scenes that don't really move the story forward. They're just neat scenes. The whole the whole bit with the bridge, 
Yeah. And it's nothing to like the story about finding the gold other than just this weird side story. We've got to blow up this bridge now. It's yeah, well it's more yeah, it's more of a commentary on their perspective and their lack of giving a shit about anything going on in the larger world. We just got to blow up this bridge so we can get to our gold. Who cares about the civil war? Also just kind of highlighting the just like the pointlessness of the, the, the like the lives that are being lost over nothing like every day they fight over this bridge once or twice a day mm-hmm. carry a bunch of bodies back home they do it all again and then our heroes just blow it up <laughs> uh I, I i love the prison camp scene with the singing trying to mask the sounds of torture and death yeah They masked the sounds of torture and death by forcing the prisoners to sing this, this wonderful song. It's, it's like, almost like a full-blown musical number in yep. the middle of this gritty Western. It's sort of interesting, it's, it's, that contrast. And the music's nice. It's, like, pretty. This pleasant, pretty song yeah. that is only there so that Angel Eyes can violently beat somebody behind the, 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 the camp leader's back. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, uh, like I said, it's not a super violent movie in terms of, like, blood squibs everywhere or anything. But that scene where Tuco's getting the shit beat out of him is pretty brutal. That's probably as almost, like, brutal the movie gets Mm -hmm. on just, like, a visceral kind of physical level. Well, it really hits you home once you realize, like, that the prisoners who are singing it, they even know what's going on. Like, one of them stops playing his fiddle just so he can start crying about everything. Yeah, yeah. And they're also, like, it's like almost like a distorted angle of them. Like, the one is, like, right up in the lens. And he's weird looking. It's this weird looking little Italian guy. Everybody's <laughs> weird looking. All the extras of the movie. Well, they're not just Italian. Like, what's going on here? This is a um, Italian western that was made in conjunction with Germany and filmed in Spain okay. with some American actors. Well, that's uh, Josh and I talked about Suspiria, so we talked a little bit about the uh, the, the way Italians for decades made movies, which is they would shoot without sound. And all the actors would be speaking their own language. So they'd have American actors and Italian actors and Spanish actors. And then everything would be dubbed over later in English or whatever. And that seems like such a weird, bad way to make a movie. (laughs) It is a weird, bad way to make a movie. As far as performances go, because it's like you're speaking English and then the guy you're supposed to be reacting to is speaking Spanish back to you and you don't know what the fuck he's saying. I mean, you do because you've read the script, I guess, but to try and maintain a performance when everybody's speaking a different language. And that also leads to with the dubbing, like Lee Van Cleef dubs himself, so he sounds mostly fine. The mouth mostly matches. But then he's interacting with like the guy with no legs. Like that doesn't match at all. I don't he's know if- speaking German or something. It could the, be the, German, the, the, the I don't lips, know. The lips do not match at all. Yeah. The thing that wasn't saved though was the coins. But then the army decides, of course, it ought to hold a hearing and Jackson's acquitted. For someone that likes the weirdo, nonsensical Italian horror movies. That becomes like an attribute to it. It's kind of like a charm. And it's it's different in this because those are so kind of intentionally surreal. And this is so like kind of gritty and grounded mm-hmm. that the dubbing is kind of distracting. Not enough because there's not a lot of dialogue really. Um, and it's more, I mean, I don't think there's any dialogue for the first like 15 minutes or something. It's yeah. all just told visually. Yeah. But it is a little jarring when they start speaking. And what they're saying doesn't match at all. <laughs> I, I think I'm just like super used to it, but yeah, it's it's a weird thing. That's those Italians, they did it for decades. I'll forgive it for the good, the bad, and the ugly, but <laughs> we're watching Warriors of the Apocalypse. <laughs> Fuck that shit. Never underestimate Sam. He thinks of everything. Besides, all the old catacombs have security monitors. We just plugged in. See, that's more my comfort zone. We've seen, like, the weirdo, <laughs> shitty, trashy movies. It's like, oh, it's funnier that they don't, the dialogue doesn't match. Here, though, you're so, like, it's so intense and it's so well executed. And that's the one thing, that's the one, like, kind of hiccup is, no, no, I can't, like, it, it's, like, takes you out of it a little bit. You want to try the pistol? Just step out Let's back. Go. I will say, I, I watched the 4K version, and I was like, this looks gorgeous. I wonder if this is the same one that's available streaming. I don't know how you watched it. I watched it streaming. Okay. I compared it to uh, the, at least the version that's on Amazon, that you can rent on Amazon. And that version had, like, way more of a yellowish, tannish tint to it. 
And it was sort of weird looking after watching this gorgeous, perfect restoration. Really? Now I need to see the 4K version. Now. In the in the way, especially in the wake of like HBO Max shit just being pulled and the the streaming era where things can just be removed and you'll never see them again. They're going to remove it when they realize that Tuco is not played by a Mexican man. Canceled. <laughs> Canceled. <laughs> Well, damn. Hey, given the, 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 the history of Western movies, this is probably the least problematic one. I, I can't imagine watching anything with cowboys versus Indians <laughs> in this day and age. There's some movie, I think it's a Roger Corman movie, because Dick Miller is in it. Good old Dick Miller. And they were filming one side of a battle, and he was playing a cowboy. And then when they went to film the other side of the battle, they had him get dressed up to play an Indian. So he's basically fighting himself. So. <laughs> oh, Dick Miller. Dick Miller. Oh, Roger Corman. That's how you did it, I guess. <laughs> so that's, I mean, I'm sure there's good classic Westerns that I've never seen, but I always associate it with stuff like that, like kind of corny. Uh, so to see a movie like this that still holds up and still plays so well. I'm, I'm glad you liked it. I was, there was a part of me that was worried that you would watch this and say, Rich, what the fuck are you talking about? No, no, I, I, I loved it. I think it starts a bit slow. The first like act of the movie is like an hour. It's almost an hour into the movie. I think it's almost exactly an hour to the movie when they kind of get the the plot really going, where they find the uh, what's the the one soldier's name that whispers to uh, Ben Carson. Ben Car, yeah. When they whisper, he whispers the because that's the whole like crux of the movie is that Tuco knows the cemetery where the gold is buried at, but... Only Clint Eastwood knows the name of the tombstone it's buried under. Yeah, yeah. So, so they have to work together. The, yes. Yeah, uh, unlikely allies, untrustworthy <laughs> allies, having to, you know, team up and, and then Lee Van Cleef's the worst one. He just wants to steal all the gold. So that's like the conflict of the whole movie. And yeah, it's like an hour into the movie before that happens. I've heard part of the reason for like, like some of the slow portions of these movies is um, uh, Ennio Morricone. Mm -hmm. did the music first. Okay. <laughs> and Sergio Leone wanted to let the music play out because he liked it so much. Okay. Like, you know how they, you know how they uh, don't use the actual dialogue, the actors speaking in their own language, they dub it later? Yeah. Yeah, they had the music playing on the set. Okay. Yeah. So they'd be listening to the music while they're acting. So they had to kind of like pace the scene out to the music. Yes, rather than the other way around, which, as good as the music is... That did kind of fuck with some of the pacing. <laughs> That's, again, those Italians. They do everything wrong when it comes to filmmaking. <laughs> they introduce Lee Van Cleef at the very beginning, and then he's out of the movie for like an hour and a half. It's almost mistitled. <laughs> it very much is just the good and the ugly. Mm -hmm. Because Lee Van Cleef, it's, it's the beginning. He's got the great scene in the beginning. That slow, very horribly intimidating scene where he destroys a family. He just sits down and starts like eating soup or something. Without a word. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Again, I, I think Tarantino might have been influenced by this just a little bit. <laughs> and it's the most intimidating thing. And he's just, he's just eating somebody else's dinner. You know? Well, that shot when he comes in, like, again, that's like, I can't imagine watching this like cropped to four by three because there's the, the guy eating in the foreground you see over his shoulder and Lee Van Cleef comes in in the distance. And just like the composition of that shot is great. You don't even really understand what the scenario is at first, but you're already on edge. You, you just know he's trouble. Yeah. He's just standing in this doorway, this dark figure looming there. Because Lee Van Cleef looks like the devil. <laughs> he looks like an evil man. I'm sure in real life he was lovely, but he has the, the most, like, jagged features I've ever seen. And he shows up. When's the next time he shows up? He briefly shows up at the second, like, hanging. Yeah. So just so you know, he's still around. Just a reminder, I guess, because he has nothing to do. For and then I don't think he shows up again until the prison camp. After that great scene where Clint Eastwood and the Ugly get captured by the Union. <laughs> they're, they're wearing their Confederate uniforms. <laughs> <laughs> and the, 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 the army comes in. All they're, they're wearing gray. We're good. Just act natural. <laughs> and then that wonderful just knocks the dust off his uniform. <laughs> it opened the movie up in a way and kind of put the, the, the main story of the movie in a completely different context than I was expecting. Mm -hmm. Where it's like, this is the, 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 the classic little Western story, but there's this much larger story going on yeah. in the background. So I, I loved it. I, I'm going to watch the other ones now. I don't know <laughs> They're if we'll different. Do a, I don't know if we'll do a review on them because I don't know if we'll have the same reaction that I did to this movie. Probably but, not. Okay. Probably not. The other, the other two are nowhere near as epic as this one is. Okay. But 
I like Clint Eastwood's character more. Like in in uh, a fistful of dollars, Clint Eastwood just has my favorite just character introduction ever. Mm. He just walks into town and he spends the first ten minutes just observing everything, and then this just glorious moment of horrific violence, and he gets a job. Get three coffins ready. Uh -huh. Well, that's that's interesting to look at this movie as. It almost feels, not, not a parody of American Westerns, but definitely taking a lot of the tropes and kind of subverting them, like I said earlier. And doing that, it's almost like postmodern, and then it becomes like the most famous Western of all time, and like the most influential. It got us one, close, one step closer to Unforgiven, which completely subverts the, the Western. Second anti-violence movie that's violent. It unglorifies the violence. Oh. But it's violent. <laughs> so it's okay. <laughs> uh, but yeah, as someone that is not a huge Western fan, but loves films and filmmaking, uh, I was uh, blown away by Good, the Bad, and the Ugly. If, if you're a Gen Xer and you're stuck in your childhood of <laughs> Back to the Future and Ghostbusters and Star Wars, I don't know, maybe, maybe, maybe break out of that mold. Try something, something different. Go, go full boomer and watch a Western. Go full boomer. Your grandpa likes Westerns. Everyone's grandpa likes Westerns. <laughs> be like your grandpa. Westerns can be cool. 